take your Bible and find the second book of the Old Testament, the Exodus, the book of Exodus, the leaving of God's people after 430 years of bondage. And once again, we come in chapter 17, we come to another wonderful compound name of the Lord. We mean by the name, the words compound, that means a word that goes along with the name Jehovah. So just to review, we have seen Elohim, that's God the Father, God the Son, the Trinity, and the creator and preserver. Jehovah, the self-existing one that reveals truth, holiness, justice, and provides. El Shaddai, the Almighty, and the book of Genesis chapter 17, God told Abraham, I am the Almighty, walk thou before me and be thou perfect. El Shaddai is the God that's all sufficient, the big breasted God that flows out, supplies, and meets our needs. And then Adonai. Adonai, of course, is the name Lord, capital L, and then the rest all in small case. That means master and Lord. So to be master means that he has taken control of our lives. If he's your master, he's also your Lord. And then we begin to look at the Jehovah names. We look at Genesis chapter 22, Jehovah Jireh, and saw that God provided a lamb for Abraham as he was offering up his son Isaac. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord sees and the Lord will provide. Well, is Jehovah Jireh in our lives? Does he see? Does he provide for us? And then last time we saw Jehovah Rafi, and Jehovah Rafi, of course, is the Lord that healeth. So he heals, he cures, he restores, and he repairs. So this evening, then, let's look here in Exodus chapter 17. Let's just read the whole chapter. It begins, once again, with the murmurings of the children of God, uh, murmuring because of the way, and murmuring because they don't have a place to get some water. So once again, they're criticizing. Now, God had already taken care of them at the place called Myra, the bitter waters, and God told them to put a tree in, and representing the cross, and the waters would made, bitter would made, be made sweet. Now, once again, they're journeying. And remember, not all that came out of Egypt were saved. Not all that came out of Egypt, there was a mixed multitude. Just like there is in the church, there's a mixed multitude. Not everybody that is in the church, not everybody that names the name of God is saved. And of course, we have the great illustration with the parable of the sower, four different soils, and only one of them actually was good ground and a good heart. And so that means one out of four saved. So once again, we find Israel and her journeys. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their, their journeyings according to the commandments of the Lord. That, of course, the name Lord there all in caps, Jehovah. And pitched in Rephidim, and there was a problem. What's the problem? No water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt Jehovah? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. Goodness gracious. You would think these people had learned a lesson. Passing the Red Sea, leaving Egypt with the wealth of Egypt, how God provided and how God delivered. And yet, when circumstances come up, 
in our lives, how sometimes we complain to the Lord rather than learning to wait upon the Lord. So what did Moses do? Well, he took the rod and killed them all. Not what he did. What did he do? The same thing that we need to do when we're in trouble. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, don't forget the rod, where thou smote the waters, take it in thy hand and go. In other words, that rod is how they passed the Red Sea. The people murmured or complained. Behind them came Pharaoh and his elite uh, chariots and, and army, his elite special forces. To the side and to the left were mountains. To the front was the Red Sea. And Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord said, Tell the people, stand still <coughs> and see the glory of the Lord. And, of course, the Red Seas parted. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa, <coughs> excuse me, and Meribah. Why? Because of the chiding of the children of Israel. So chiding. <clears throat> and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? <clears throat> what an attitude. What a complaining group. And that's why eventually Moses lost his temper. And when God told him to speak to the rock later on, He's going to smite the rock twice because he's fed up. He says, you rebels, must I fetch you water out of the rock? And he missed the promised land. So there are great lessons for us in the Old Testament about trusting the Lord. Now, here's the point. <clears throat> Verse 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose you out, men, and go out, fight with Elimelech. <clears throat> Tomorrow I will stand in the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Elimelech. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed his hands. Thank the Lord for the pastor that has people that stand by him and for him and with him and hold up his hands. The one on the one side, the other on the other side. His hands were steady under the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial and a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek, from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, now watch the name for this evening, Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. For he said, because the Lord had sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to to generation. And now, Father, we pray that you add the blessing to your word to our hearts. What does this have to do with us? And isn't that always the question? 
How is this applicable to me? How does this story and this message apply to 21st century children of God? Lord, I'm thankful that you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And the I am of the Old Testament, sure enough, the Jesus of the New Testament. Make this practical for us. Help us to see how this is applicable in our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> of all the names thus far that we have read, this probably is the most applicable <clears throat> to help you and I in our lives. I want you to find Galatians. We're going to just keep your finger there in numbers, but Galatians chapter 5. So we come now to the third compound name, God. <clears throat> it's a few weeks since the Lord had pro provided healing. Of course, Jehovah Rafi. Now here we are in Rephidim. Moses has stricken the rock, as we have seen in the first verses of Exodus 17. <clears throat> And now there's a struggle going on in the battle with Elimelech. <clears throat> the Amalekites, sorry, I said Elimelech, I didn't mean that. <clears throat> Amalek. So Amalek is a descendant of Esau. He is a descendant of Esau. And remember, Esau and his brother Isaac were the two sons of Abraham and Sarah. And we have spent quite a bit of time talking about that relationship with Abraham and Isaac and the promised child and, of course, the bond child. That's a beautiful picture of the flesh and the spirit. This is so applicable because it applies to our daily life. Notice now Galatians chapter 5, and by the way, what did the book of Exodus said that you'll fight with Emelech forever? Well, you and I, as God's children, uh, the flesh is not saved. God doesn't save our flesh, he saves our soul. And there's always going to be a struggle, there's always going to be a war against the flesh, and here it is right for us in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16 is a tremendous verse as we'd apply it to our lives and walk in it daily. This I say, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And here's the problem, daily with the child of God. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, 17 sins from verses 19 through 21 that I'm not going to read, but those are 17 sins. Remember, as a child of God, if you go back now to Genesis chapter 36. Who's Amalek? Who's Amalek? Go back to Genesis chapter 36 now. So when we begin to understand that God saves a sinner, but then a battle begins. First is the battle before you come to the Lord and Satan does what he does to blind your eyes to keep you from hearing the truth so that you remain lost and his servant. But then the moment you become saved, now you have an opportunity to live right and serve the Lord. So Genesis chapter 36 and verse number 12, and Timnah was con concubine to Eliphaz, uh, Esau's, son 
and she bare Eliphaz and Melech. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Now, Numbers chapter 24. There's a big problem here with Amalek. Numbers 24 shows us that Amalek is opposed to Israel, and the flesh is opposed to the spirit. So Numbers chapter 24 And verse 20, and when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter, latter end shall be that he perish forever. So Amalek attacked Israel, and look at how he did it. Deuteronomy chapter 25. So now just go to... Numbers and go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and see the Amalekites and how wicked this nation was. Again, descendants of Esau. Esau hated his birthright. Esau was a man of the flesh. Esau was a great hunter, and of course, his father loved his venison. And uh, tells me Isaac was a fleshly man not so spiritual. So Deuteronomy chapter 25, and notice, if you will, beginning in verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 25. God wants to destroy Amalek. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt. 430 years of bondage. They're going to the promised land. They stop. Decide rather than going the 11 day journey to the promised land. They bicker. They fight. They moan. They complain. And uh, they suffer in the wilderness for 40 years. How he met thee by the way. Now notice the wickedness of these people. The Malachites. And smote the hindermost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it should be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thy enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek. For from under heaven thou shalt not forget it. So again, just think about it. the Israelites have come out of Egypt, the stragglers behind, the little ones, the weak ones. Find first Samuel chapter 15. The work weak ones, those who were not able to keep up. And they attacked the weakest. And that's what Satan does. He attacks your flesh. And he does all he can to stop you. If you're sick, he likes to jump on you. There's probably nothing more <clears throat> distracting than a head cold. Just a head cold, a runny nose, a fever, and uh, the... Winter time, as we go through that time, and you begin to feel the ravishes of a cold. Sometimes you begin to get a twitch in your eye. It affects people differently. You get a little twitch in your eye. If I start getting a twitch in my eye, I know I'm getting ready to be in trouble. And then, of course, you have the sniffles and the nose is running, and, and you're up most of the night, can't sleep. And so, again, just those little things that bother you. And the biggest thing, when you're sick, is Satan jumps all over that. If you have some kind of a deficiency, if you have an issue, and we think of our dear Anita in need of a kidney transplant, 
We think of Denelda with the knee. We think of Willie in the hospital with cancer. We think of Gretchen's two sisters, the one with a blood disorder, the other one with thyroid cancer. And you can think if you suffer with diabetes or you suffer with some kind of an ailment, and, and sometimes what the devil will do is he'll get you to want to curse God and complain to God about why sickness comes. And we talked about that last week with Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. God doesn't always choose to heal. And why things happen to a child of God, nobody has the answer. And some things we won't find out until we get to glory, but we must trust him. We must look to him, recognizing that nothing touches your life that doesn't come through his hand first. Now here we have Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, the first king of Israel. Last week I spoke about the kingdom uh, coming and one day Jesus will be the monarch of the world and he will reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years and he will be the king of king and lord of lords. But now meanwhile, here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord, again that's Jehovah, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Oh, that we might believe God's word and rely on God's word and meditate on God's work and word and walk in his word. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. And of course, that's a reference right from Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19, we just read. Did to Israel how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, utterly destroy all that they have, spare them not. Now, let's jump down further. And uh, verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me, that hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. Here the prophet is suffering with a broken heart. Remember, he anointed Saul. When Saul came to Samuel and Saul was looking for the two donkeys that had ran away from his father, and so Saul and his servant looking for the donkey. <clears throat> Remember, of course, that God is going to give them a king, though God does not want them to have a king, but they've asked for a king in chapter 8. So God gives them that king, head and shoulder above everybody. And however, when Saul was anointed king, he was very shy, kind of innocent. But when he got power, he went somewhat crazy and turned away from the things of the Lord. While he was... Young and tender, he was humble. But when he got power, and we said last Sunday that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So here then, the Bible says that God is upset. Not only is he upset, but Samuel was brokenhearted because Samuel was told by the Lord, there's a guy coming and uh, you're going to anoint him and he's going to be the king. Here's the man that the people are waiting for and his name is Saul and you're going to anoint him, son of Sis. Verse 12. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel saying, Saul come to came, came to Carmel and behold, he set him up a place has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. 
And Samuel came to Saul and said to him, Blessed be thou. And Saul said, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of Jehovah. Really? And Samuel said, Really? I'm adding the word really. It's not there. <laughs> you performed, did you? Well, what's the bleeding? What is the meaning of the bleeding of the sheep in my ears? And the lowing of the oxen which I hear. And Saul said, same thing that everybody does when they get in trouble, what do we do? We blame others. Let's <laughs> just put the blame on some. Not my fault, it's your fault. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites and for the people, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the ox to sacrifice on the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. And Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, Now here it is. When thou wast little in thy own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord set thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the Amalekites, the sinners. Notice the sinners. Be sure your sin will find you out. The nation with the God will be turned into hell. And sinners without Christ go to hell. They go to hell. And that's true. And that's the reality of it. And we must mourn the lost. Lift up Christ and let people know that Christ has died on the cross. Salvation is available. So they're sinners. But there's a problem here. You've spared that which God said that he would destroy. So, verse 18 again. Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Isn't it sad that nations and, and governments, when, when someone murders someone, they're more concerned about the safety of the murderer than the victim. What a corrupt government, a corrupt world. And they stick up for the murderer rather than the, of course, innocent person that was killed. <clears throat> wherefore, verse 19, did thou, wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? But did fly upon the spoil, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Really? And have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have at least destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took, again, blame shifting, but the people took of the spoil. Aren't you the king? Aren't you the leader? But the people took the spoils, sheep and oxen and sheep and things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice and Lord. You can't do bad to do good. You cannot do bad to do good. To sacrifice and the Lord God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, hath the Lord, and here is their whole point, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrificing Sacrifices is obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken the fat of the lamb. Well, finally, Second First Chronicles chapter four. God does catch up to the Amalekites. This time it's King Hezekiah and First Chronicles. Chapter 4 and verse 43. And they smote the rest of the Amalekites that were escaped and dwelled there unto this day. So let's digress. Go back now to Exodus chapter 17. What's the significance of the rod? What does the rod have to do about anything? And the banner. 
Well, the banner in ancient, ancient times was not always a flag. Oftentimes it was a pole with a shiny object at the top. And if you think about the Roman Empire, and if you've seen pictures or movies about the Roman Empire, they're going and marching, or you've seen armies marching, they'll have a flag to represent who they are. But in the top is a, like with Rome, it's an eagle, and uh, there's something shiny up there. So that flag then, or that rod, uh, banner means glittering. And uh, Nisa, Jehovah Nisan, the rod of Moses was God's banner. And notice Exodus chapter 4, go back there. The rod of Moses was the banner. This stood for his cause and for the battle. The rod was a symbol of the pledge of Jehovah's presence and his power. Now, Moses, we know the story, is getting ready to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. After 430 years of bondage, Moses now is going to go to Pharaoh and plead for the people of God, and God is going to deal with him. So notice verse 1 of chapter 4 of Exodus. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thy hand? And he said, A rod. And he, notice, and he said, Cast it, God said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a snake, a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. I'd have ran too. <laughs> And the Lord said to Moses, put forth thy hand. What? What? Put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. Oh, really? <laughs> Snake? Put, put your hand and grab it by the tail. Ooh. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, had appeared to thee. Notice, and the Lord said furthermore unto him, put thy hand in thy bosom. So here's Moses' hand, nothing wrong with it, sticks it in his bosom, pulls it out and it's leprous. So, <laughs> I think that would have scared him maybe more <clears throat> than the snake. And he put his hand in his bosom and when he took it out, behold, it was leprous as snow. And he said, God said, put thy hand in thy bosom again. He put his hand in his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. So here's a tremendous picture for us. And I'd like you to go to Deuteronomy again, uh, chapter number one. Here's a beautiful picture of flesh. Flesh. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And so clean hands for service and a pure heart for service. So the rod is for service, our hands are for work. So Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse number 30, if you'll notice. <clears throat> so the priests were to encourage the people of God and tell them, remember the battle is Jehovah's. Look at verse 30. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Chapter 3, Deuteronomy chapter 3. And verse 22. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. Chapter number 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. So what's the lesson? The lesson is the battle is the Lord's symbolized by that banner, Jehovah Nisi. Chapter 20, verse 1. When thou goest out to battle, against thy enemies. So let's make that 21, 21st century Christians. 
Do you have enemies? I have enemies. Every day in the world we have enemies, at least three, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we fight those enemies, and you cannot fight them with flesh and blood. If you try to fight them by your prowess, by your personality, by your education, by how much education you may have, education is good to a fault, but you can't fight the devil by education. Don't matter how high your IQ is, don't matter how great your personality is, or your prowess, the Lord will fight our battles. When the, notice, when thou goest to battle against thy enemies and see horses and chariots and people, remember Elisha, oh, when, the, when the enemy of the Lord came to Elisha and his servant woke up in the morning and making a pot of tea and there were the Midianites all around and his servant said, my master, how should I do? And Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. And the Lord showed him chariots of fire. And Elijah said, there are more that be with us than be with them. So every day in the world, we fight those enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And again, when you're sickly, you're feeling a little sick, hard to be spiritual, but be spiritual, be faithful. Well, I can't read my Bible. Well, I have a little thought for you a little idea for you, a little formula for you. You're so sick you can't read your Bible. And by the way, you ought to read your Bible. You ought to have, you ought to have a Bible. Now there's a lot of electronics today and people you, but you ought to have a Bible. Why should you have a Bible? Because when you read the Word of God and you have a, I read the Word of God with a pen in my hand or a marker. And when God speaks to my heart, I underscore that verse. I put a date there, and I'll put the word glory there. And as I go through my Bible, and there may be a time as I'm going through it, and as I go through the word of God, I'll come across that verse again. Well, in a month. In a month, uh, I read through the book of Romans twice in a month. And the book of Acts uh, 28 chapters, but I read through them, and I read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, read many chapters, many verses, and so forth. But, but I underscore it. And God speaks to my heart. And I'll go back, and maybe there's a promise, and I'll claim that promise, and I'll put sell motorhome. Back in 1984, sell motorhome. Going to Canada, sell motorhome. And, of course, the Lord sold the motorhome. And then wife's illness, cancer, and this and that, and write out things. And then I come across them, and I have many Bibles. And uh, sometimes I wear out a Bible. And this Bible, I've been preaching from this Bible um, since 08. This has been my preaching Bible. And uh, so I've been preaching from this Bible since 2008. But I have Bibles that I read at home, have Bibles in the office. And when I'm preaching, let's say I'm preaching from a text, such as last week, Isaiah 9 and verse 6 and 7. I'll go through my library, and I'll bring out my Bibles, and I'll look up Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 and see what the Lord may have taught me back then, and I'll have some idea. So again, read your Bible. Get a hold of your Bible. And if you're ill and can't read it, uh, Google Alexander Scorby. Alexander Scorby that reads the King James Bible, he does a really good job. And by the way, because of names in the Bible, names are very difficult, and pronunciation. I remember preaching from Acts 27 years ago, and when that storm came, the storm was Arachlodon. And a preacher once preached in our church, and obviously didn't read Alexander Scorby, and he had a crazy name. And, uh, and he kept repeating it over and over. I want to say, you're not pronouncing it right. And I don't pronounce it right. But Alexander Scorvey, my opinion, if you want to listen to someone, read the Bible. And if you're sick, read it and listen to him. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now you have two avenues, so you have the Word of God. But get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, get yourself a Bible. Read your Bible. 
and uh, uh, I have an iPad at home, but, but I write out my sermons. I'm not going to bring that iPad up here. And I figure the thing will probably break and I lose my notes. So, uh, and I know there's a lot of electronics, I get that, but uh, I'm just old fashioned and uh, that's free. That was in the message, but I just wanted to give that to you and uh, to underscore your Bible. When thou goest out to battle against thy enemies and see horses and chariots and people more than thou, and be not, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Remember when he saved you out of bondage? Egypt is a picture of the world. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. And it should be when ye are come nigh unto the battle, and the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be you terrified because of them. Why? For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to do what? To save you. Look at the next book, Joshua. Joshua. Now Moses is gone, but Joshua chapter 1 is a tremendous book over and over and over. Uh, Joshua, of course, is now taking the gauntlet from Moses. And verse 2, Moses, my servant, Joshua 1, 2, is dead now. Therefore, rise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people in the land which I have given to them, even to the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot should tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and so forth, the Hittites and all these different nations. And uh, notice, there shall not be any man uh, able, and I know what you're thinking, he can't pronounce those names. <laughs> Let's read them. <laughs> anyway, they just come to my mind. <laughs> from the Wilderness of this Lebanon, even in the great river, the river of Euphrates, land of the Hittites, on the great sea towards the going down of the sun, should be your coast. There should not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. What a promise. What a promise. But remember, we have promises. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Visiting Willie yesterday, I took his hand. I said, remember... The Lord said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And then I went through his ten fingers. I can do all things through Christ. Which, so the Lord of the Old Testament is the, is the God of the New Testament. Same yesterday, today, and forever. So he'll fight your battles. Whatever the battle you may have, maybe someone at work. Isn't that where the battles are at? Work. Somebody at work that takes advantage of you. Somebody at work that just drives you crazy, and uh, and those people it seems like <laughs> it, it seems like work or even at church. There's people at church they drive you crazy. They just they just drive you crazy. They can't help it. They're just who they are, and you are who you are. You may drive them crazy, and so remember that the Lord is for us. Now I'm not saying we battle at the church or you battle at work, but remember the Lord is for you. And he's with you. And if you put on the whole armor of God daily, if you yield to the Holy Spirit, I told Willie this Monday, I said, now, if you listen to my, my sermon, or I looked at the clock, I said, it's 3 o'clock. And going on 3 o'clock, and he was waiting to get some meds. And I said, Willie, look at the clock. It's going on 3 o'clock. I said, I've been teaching the people at church 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, every three hours to submit to the Lord. Yield to the Holy Spirit. If you've done something in those three hours, if you fought with your wife, your husband, your family, your parents, what have you, and get it right. Keep it right so that you can be spirit-filled. This I say, walk in the spirit. You should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. So I've been married for, what have we been married now? Five years? And uh, so I've been married at a zero to that. So all these years that we've been married, you think everything is wonderful in our home? You think everything is always wonderful in our home? And, uh, and because we're two people. But the Bible says two should be what? One flesh. So we're one in the Lord. And so the Holy Spirit wants to control our lives. 
And so here, Joshua, imagine Joshua filling Moses' shoes, a big order to do. And the Lord says to him, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will be there. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Unto, notice. For unto this people shall thou divide for inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong, very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper wherever so thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou may observe to do according to the, all that is written therein. For then shall thou make thy way prosperous, then shall thou have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whether so thou, ever thou goest. Now look at chapter 23. Chapter 23. <clears throat> Chapter 23. Did you know that Joshua defeated 31 kings and kingdoms? And as Joshua is closing the book of Joshua, he said, everything that God said that he will do, he has done. And you and I need to understand that. One of those wonderful verses in the Bible, and it came to pass. So going through troubles, and you will always have struggles. You will never get to the place where you say, I have arrived. If you did, you better check yourself. Because we won't arrive till we get to glory. And until we get then, we'll have battles, but we'll have blessings. Notice, if you will, verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he that fighteth for you as he hath promised thee. Take good heed therefore unto yourself that you love the Lord your God. Verse 14, And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your soul that not one thing, oh my goodness, not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all are come to pass. And ye, and unto you, and unto everyone, everything hath failed thereof. And not one of these things have failed thereof. Now, let me just share something with you. Miss Glenn and I, just on a daily basis, we uh, got a new dishwasher because the old one, uh, she wasn't available anymore. <laughs> the old one oh, she perished. So the new one was coming. And uh, we waited and 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 waited. And then it arrived. And uh, so they called us and said, it's in. And we we're all excited. And then they said, oh, but you can't have it because it fell off the truck. <laughs> So then, in August, this is what? December the 8th. I like the number 8, New Beginnings, but anyway. August the 8th. August, oh, this is December the 8th. August, September, so September, October, November, December. We ordered a microwave in August. And they make you pay up front. So, finally it came in. The first excuse, or one of the many excuses was, well, flooding in B.C. And then uh, the flood, Noah's flood, it, it was washed away. Anyway, finally it showed up. We were all excited. It showed up yesterday. No, yesterday too. It showed up Monday. I'm oh, excited. It's come. The guys came in. I said, I'm so happy you guys are here. You don't have to have a cigarette today. 
I have a little sucker for you. So I gave him a sucker. I thank you. Really. So about four hours later, all excited, four hours later, you guessed it. It doesn't work. <laughs> put holes in the wall and uh, put drilled holes and uh, so it doesn't work. I said, you got, so I, <laughs> it was hard for me to go down and say to Mrs. G, sweetie, <laughs> you never believe it. <clears throat> oh, I believe it, dear. Anyway, I said, it doesn't work. What? <clears throat> so they took it apart and sure enough, some wire was, anyway, so they sent it back. So I'm saying just in a day, just in a day, that may have made you gone crazy. I said, you know what, I'm not mad. I said, I just want you to know, remember these hands are lethal, boys. <laughs> Get it out of the house. So anyway, in the daily life, we fight with the world, flesh, and the devil. But I gave those boys a track, like I did the last time they were there. And I said, now, all seriousness, I said, I hope you'll read this again. And, and this is serious business, and you need to know the Lord. But what if I'd have gotten my flesh? You know said something terrible or nasty. And they just said, huh, I thought that guy's a preacher. So the world, the flesh, and the devil will be with you till you get to glory. Shall we stand together? I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I have a big brother looks after me. I'm glad I have armament to put on. I'm glad I have the Holy Spirit to guide me, direct my life. And he does you too. And the God of Moses is my God. The God of Joshua, Jacob, plain man, he's my God. So Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. And he will take care of us. If we look to him, trust in him, wait on him, and just end a day, you got to go to work tomorrow. There's probably someone there that drives you crazy. Christmas is coming. You probably have a relative that drives you crazy. Maybe you drive them crazy. But remember, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So you're home alone. You're never alone because he's with you. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. And Lord, as you told Moses, and then Moses missed the promised land because he got in his flesh and got angry and got upset with the people. And Lord, that happens to preachers all the time. They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel accepted. They don't feel they should get enough or get enough. And all these things happen and preachers get angry. And Lord, when a preacher gets angry and bitter, he's done for. And Lord, that's applicable to God's children. We get in our flesh. We get upset. We get sideways with one another. We feel like we're unappreciated. We pray that the things that we do, nobody thinks about them or is acknowledging them. But Lord, you do. So help us to look to you, wait on you, to trust you, and realize these wonderful Jehovah names. The one that sees, provides. The one that is holy and just and pure. And Lord, we're thankful for these Old Testament wonderful names. And when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. And the I am of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. So Lord, help us to keep on keeping on and help us to be faithful and help us, Lord, when we read that Old Testament and see your name in caps, Lord, and see your name, God, big G, little O and D, Elohim, the plurality of the deity of the Trinity that's for us. You on your throne, Jesus at your right hand, intercessing on our behalf, praying for us. When we sin and confess our sin 
And Satan comes up to accuse us. He stands and says it's all under the blood. And Lord, it is under the blood when we confess it and keep short accounts. Help us to be spirit-filled, controlled. Help us to walk in thy spirit. Help us to put that armament on. Help us to be quick to forgive and not to wear our feelings upon our sleeves and have our pride Stop us from the fullness of your blessings. Encourage us tonight, as you told Joshua over and over, be strong and very courageous. And you told him, you better get the book. You better stay in the book. You better stay humble. You better stay on your knees and know that as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. And Lord, as you were with those Old Testament guys, you're with us in this 21st century. So deliver us from fear, perfect love, casteth out fear, fear has torment. And Lord, we're not perfect when we're living in fear and torment. Satan likes to scare us and put fear upon our hearts. Lord, thou hast not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Get us home safely now. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night. God bless.